Hi everyone, in previous videos I've always spoken about very large scale bioreactors. However, you will see a lot of us use shake flasks in the lab or even like micro titer plates. Um, and then also you will see in industry there's a move towards going to smaller reactors. Well controlled, smaller reactors and scaling out, which is where you kind of add more in parallel rather than just scaling up because we know that scale up has like a negative impact on certain parameters. So in this video I'm going to delve into a little bit more depth into some type of miniature bioreactors that we have. Now as mentioned there's a real trend in the pharmaceutical industry which uh, first it used to be batch uh, processes which were much more popular in the 90s and they were very well established to go to large scale. But you will see there's a trend to go towards smaller but continuous systems because we do know that continuous systems are much more cost effective and also like this will be easier to control. So this might have like very significant advantages in terms of quality. And a, a bit of a trend you can see in this image here, which is taken from this viewpoint article. So why would we want to consider actually miniature bioreactors, a small bioreactor rather than like a large scale vessel, which seems to make much more sense in our head. Well, very specifically to the pharmaceutical industry, that's quite a volatile market. So it means there's quite a lot of changes coming in. So you need to be able to work with a system which is quite versatile to adapt to current demands. Uh, and that can be something that's kind of related to drug shortages at a certain time, thinking of like the large scale vaccine production nowadays as well. But also because developing nations are catching up in terms of the drugs that they use. So there's also like a growing demand in that area. And if you have these smaller reactors, um, not always continuous, but let's, let's assume smaller reactors in general, you have much more flexibility. It's a lower cost, not just from operating, but uh, often you can also, you don't necessarily need to use stainless steel. So you will see lots of disposable and plastic reactors, which are much lower in capital investment costs. And if you work with a continuous system, uh, in principle, you should be able to control certain parameters a lot better, which will have a positive impact on quality. Because we do know that when we start to scale up, you can never keep all of the parameters the same. And that can have like a negative impact if you're developing a pharmaceutical product. Now, the ones that you're probably more familiar with, so if you look at a microplate, which is even less than a milliliter, to, let's say, shake flask can go up to 500 milliliter, but it can be a little bit more than that. And there are significant problems with a shake flask, which mainly rely on surface aeration, which means that you might not be able to get enough uh, oxygen to the microorganisms for them to grow. So there's different types of uh, these miniature bioreactors, and we'll kind of divide them a bit into like we have stir tank reactors where you still have some mechanical agitation. You will have something like microplates and shake flasks. And then we also have bubble columns where the sparging of the gas actually provides the mixing, which gives like more gentle conditions in terms of shear stress. If we then look at uh, the, the scale up, so if you wanted to scale up that, that process, that's still possible, but you need to use like, it's like a scale out principle you need to use parallelization. So essentially, rather than going bigger, you just need to add more of them. So it's a modular type of concept. And here we're not really necessarily thinking of you manually handling things. So can you imagine you having to pet lots of like uh, different liquids? You will see that often on, on like uh, an industrial scale, this is combined with robotic technologies in order to make sure that everything is automated. Now, some of the current challenges that we would have with these miniature bioreactors is that we're not really sure in terms of the conditions, it needs to mimic what we have at a large scale. And a lot of typical tests are quite complicated to do uh, when you look at, for instance, offline analysis, because it means that you have to take out a sample. Uh, and if you're working with quite a small volume, that's obviously not really helpful. But also some of the traditional tests, like how you determine KLA and fluid dynamics, um, they are not easy to do in a small liquid because sometimes you have to sacrifice some of that liquid. Also, when you kind of normally determine um, like KLA, you have to kind of switch off uh, certain things. So that doesn't really necessarily help. So a lot of the values that you get are not very... Uh, I don't think we have a good system in place yet to determine the things that we do quite routinely on like a large scale. 
Now with the real, real small volumes, but even like slightly bigger as well, evaporation does start to become a problem because you can uh, imagine that if you lose a little bit in a bigger bioreactor, the effect is relatively less uh, pronounced. But here, especially in a system where that's not properly sealed and why we might not use stainless steel, this is a very common problem. And then the key thing, I mentioned the robotic handling before, but it's not just the reactor itself. Actually, nowadays, it seems to be far more challenging to do like the downstream processing in a miniature format than just the reactor itself. So think of standard things like centrifugation, filtration, all of these things, it's much better to handle them on a larger scale. Now, let's look at, for instance, some example of different devices. So if you look at shaking devices, so you have like the micro tighter plate shake flask, you can also buy some spin tubes and all of those are probably quite routinely used in labs. But in most cases, you will see that they're used for screening. So for a slightly different kind of purpose than actually uh, real production. So it means that it can give you some information for what to happen. So screening, for instance, for which cell cultures work the best or like the early development stage where you're looking at what parameters you need to control and what you need to optimize. Now, the miniature stirred tank bioreactors and the bubble columns are much more typical normal large scale reactors, but then just in a miniature format. And here you can see, for instance, an, an example in the image below where we look at a really small scale. So the dimensions are given in millimeters. So take that into account. But you still have an impeller, so you still have a mechanical agitator. You still use things like, like baffles, for instance, which is in order to promote the mixing in the surface area. You still have a motor. You can still include things like uh, an optical pH probe or a DOT probe. So in essence, it's really a small version of a large scale bioreactor. Now, the materials here do vary quite a bit. So you could have them like the standard one on a large scale would be stainless steel. But on a smaller scale, you start to see much more things like, for instance, Perspex or like a polymer based reactor or Pyrex. The key thing here, what you get is like it is almost exactly the same as a large scale reactor, but much smaller. But that also kind of complicates the setup. So in a lot of cases, when you do this, you actually want something small because it's easier to work with. And that might be the case if your material is cheaper. So it could be a reason because of investment costs. But the key problem with this one is that actually setting it up is not that straightforward. Um, so that can be like a reason. And imagine that you have to do that. Normally, you only have to do the setup once for a large scale bioreactor. But if you split that, let's say, like in a thousand smaller ones, then that's not so beneficial and it actually doesn't save you time. Another kind of established principle here, and this actually because you don't need to use an impeller for this, might be a little bit more straightforward, is a miniature bubble column. So there you use the gas sparging for mixing. So unlike the other two devices, this is a stationary device. So there is no mechanical mixing, there's no shaking whatsoever. So what you can do with this, you can have like a frit, uh, which all of them go to like an individual cell culture or something. Uh, a mixture in which you contain your microorganisms and you can get air permeation throughout the porosity that's present in the thread. So you could have that like lots of like little reactors that sit kind of next to each other. And because there's no mechanical agitation, you can imagine some advantages of that is that there's less shear stress and particularly for those microorganisms or so plant and mammalian cell cultures that are quite sensitive to shear, this actually might be a very good option. So when is the use of these miniature bioreactors a good idea? So I have mentioned before that if you want to do this like really for early stage development, when there's not a lot of money available for the screening purposes, this is one of the things you can consider this for. But like the other thing that you might want to consider is just production in general. So there is like good reasons for how you can still achieve scale up but using lots of different miniature reactors. The key thing, I will give you some examples why I think this is not so appropriate. Um, so what you will see is that, like, as I said, it's really complicated to estimate certain parameters on a small scale, because especially fluid dynamics starts to become really different. You also need to consider like the, the surface of the walls, which is really not a thing in big bioreactors. 
So if you're working with, for instance, like filaments, which have a kind of complex morphology, this is probably not the best route to go down to. The other thing that you get, the power uh, number is very strongly dependent on the vessel diameters. So your typical calculations that you might want to use for KLA don't really hold up then because your power number that you're using is not very accurate. You might also uh, underestimate the amount of shear stress that you put on the system. So that can be, obviously that's more of a problem if you work with these miniature stirred tank reactors. However, if none of the above apply, applies if you have quite a standard E. coli culture, for instance, and you're looking at something like a more like bespoke system where you just want to try out something or something where you think there might be changes in the market and you do happen to have robotic technology available in the lab, then being able to scale it up and being, autom being able to automate a lot of things if you have this robotic technology into, in, in place is becoming more and more popular. So we do expect to see more of this, not just in the laboratories like what we have, but also in industry. And what is the, the summary of this? So you will have seen that graph that showed a very clear trend going towards smaller and more going towards continuous systems. So all of that means that probably in the future, rather than all these batch type of systems, that we need to start investing in different type of equipment. And we also need to learn more about the control in these continuous reactors. So these miniature bioreactors are very cost effective because they can be made of different materials, but they're also very versatile. And the complications that come with it is, as I mentioned, there's a lot of major challenges around determining certain key parameters like KLA and OTR. And because of the struggle that we have with the sensing in this very small liquid volume, that gives challenges with the control of the processes too. And then the key thing is not just the reactor itself, but I mentioned the issues around the downstream processing. So like think simple things like filtration, which is often actually when you do it on small scale, you might lose so much of the liquid that the downstream processing is much more of a problem than the actual reactor itself. So you will see that this, this type of stirred devices are really suitable for fast growing processes. But if you are working with a system where shear stress might be a problem, your bulb uh, column reactors in a miniature form might be very suitable. So these are not just things that you see in the lab, because I think we all have micro titer plates, but you can actually find a lot of commercially available miniature bioreactors online. And you can even buy some kits, uh, some educational kits where you can try this yourself. So I do really expect to see much more of this in the future. So this was a very short video on miniature bioreactors. Do have a look at our playlist where we look at other types of bioreactors, such as, for instance, fermenters and airlift reactors and perfusion reactors. Thanks for watching.